Hello, America. Welcome back to Your Leo Nation. Your Leo Nation is where we believe in and support the rule of law, a civil society, self-responsibility. Um, got some heavy stuff to talk about today. And uh, joining us again, uh, he was so popular from our last show. Uh, couldn't wait to have him back. Marcelo Aru, my best friend for 40 years. He was two when we met, and I was 60. But um, <laughs> 60 now, it's crazy. But Happy to be back. Happy to be back. Yeah, glad to have you here. It's a, it's a great time. Obviously, Marcelo's 20-year veteran of uh, law enforcement. And um, just a great asset to have in these heavy times. And I talk about heavy. It, it's for law enforcement, um, just not good news for the profession right now. Uh, I think I'm sure all of you, if not uh, almost everybody, has seen and listened to the video from the Memphis Police Department. Um, look, there's no other word for it. It's ugly. It's ugly. This is a blow to law enforcement. I've watched almost all of the video, quite frankly, uh, even after 30 years of law enforcement myself and some of the thing, things I've seen in video or in person, I actually had to stop watching it. Um, Marcel, I know you and I were talking about it here just before the show started. Yeah, it, it's dis it, you know, it's disappointing. It's um, it's disturbing. Uh, you know, two those two words come to mind, uh, and it's unfortunate. It really is. It's uh, it's unfortunate because. As I've always said, you can't judge uh, a police department or uh, a nation of police officers over one incident. Um, but it is very disturbing. Um, uh, the control of these officers uh, shown in the video was not there. Um, the compassion that they should have had for this individual was not there. Um, their discipline and their training uh, – more importantly, was also uh, lacking. So uh, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, we you, we have to understand that use of force is part of law enforcement. But you only use the force necessary to do three things. That's affect an arrest, overcome resistance, and prevent escape. Once those things are accomplished, there is no more need to continue to use force. And um, it seems like uh, in the video, as we saw, uh, this individual was already cuffed and continually got kicked in the head. Uh, he was stood up as he was cuffed. Uh, I saw two huge blows to his face. It just, uh, what can you say? It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's saddening. It really is. It is sad, and you, know, you, you touched on something important about um, really the purpose and the limits of use of force. And when you go back and watch, uh, if you haven't watched the video, folks, watch it. And like I said, I couldn't watch all of it. It was, um, I just about got sick to my stomach um, on the second second scene. So there are two two scenes here, basic scenes. And the first, according to the reports, um, is initiated by um, a traffic stop. The traffic stop actually was a result of um, was a result of uh, uh, let's stop. Let's stop. God. Always unplug that thing. Oh, gosh, I just got to move it back. I always unplug it. Forgot today. Yeah, I Are we able to, do you want to cut back? Oh, uh, just say, just say, uh, okay, we'll, okay, we're back. Let's unplug it back. You sure? Yeah. Yeah. You sure? Be, yeah, it'll just be a quick cut. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Okay. No, no, I feel horrible. Okay. <laughs> or if you want to reset the first two things, just go for it. I'll, I'll just start with, I'll just start, um, if I start seeing it, it's going to be hard for you to edit? The, the, from the very beginning, you started over. No, just, just say we're back. Yes. Okay. Just take it back a little bit. Um, that's for the articulation. It makes sense. Okay. So what, what do you want me to say? Want to come? Just I'm. We're back. Yeah. Yeah. You can say that. Yeah. Okay. I mean. Transition. You know. All right. Or we can start from uh, uh, the first scene. 
Okay, I'll just say there, there are two scenes here. Yes, yes. Is that going to be okay for you to fix yes, it? Yes, yes. Okay, go ahead. And I can just keep talking? Yep. Okay. So there are two, there are two basic scenes here from the, uh, the Memphis um, incident. And we were talking earlier, Marcelo, about training. We're talking about tactics. Right. And the reports are that this, <clears throat> this encounter started as a result of a traffic stop. Apparently, uh, Tyree Nichols was driving recklessly. Again, this is what we're told. Mm-hmm. And this Memphis, uh, Tennessee officer initiated a traffic stop, mm-hmm. which is all fine. Right. But when you look at what the officer did when they made the stop, right. he immediately rushes the car right. and pulls the driver, Tyree, out of the car. And right. almost immediately, there's a use of force. Well, that's a use of force by definition right there. You put hands on, you pull someone out of the car. You and I have, I said, 50 years combined of law enforcement training and experience. And literally between us, probably thousands of traffic stops. I don't get your take on this, but, you know, there's there's three basic, at least, you know, I'm trained in. You, you, you have You have a a low risk traffic stop, which people consider a typical traffic stop. Right. You have a high risk and a felony. Right. And those levels can vary, I'm sure, from agency to agency or region to region. But that's basically what we're looking at here. Right. But here's the commonality between any levels of those stops. You never r- rush a car and pull someone out of the vehicle. Am I wrong? Absolutely right. So, uh, so some of that is because of the unknown. Right. Um, so you make a traffic stop. We have to remember that when an officer makes a traffic stop, he has time to run the plate. Information comes back. But you have to remember that the information that comes back, unless there's a warrant on the car. That's one thing. Um, it'll be a coast six, a coast six Charles vehicle. Right. Then that turns into now a high risk stop. Right. Because the warrants on the vehicle doesn't necessarily mean that the person driving it is that person. We have to understand that we have limited information when we run a vehicle. It is name, registration, uh, address, you know, whoever the car is registered to, as you know. But that's all the information you have. Now, when someone is driving rec- recklessly, we have to understand, one, is he, do we know if he's escaping from a shooting? Mm -hmm. Uh, did he just rob somebody? You you don't have that information. Um, and so that's the reason why you don't go rushing a vehicle, opening the door and pulling somebody out. You have no idea, you know, even if it's for, for reckless driving, you have no idea why this person's doing what he's doing. Well, not, and it was absolutely right. But, and, and not to mention the fact that this is the worst example of officer safety or a perfect example of lack of officer safety. You rush up and you put yourself in a position uh, of exposing yourself wide open, like a bullseye to the, to the driver. There's no time to evaluate the inside of the vehicle, to find out this person's arm, to see where their hands are, if they're passengers, if there's a weapon secreted. So, I'm focusing on this initial contact with Mr. Nichols to really expose the, the lack of awareness, apparently the, either the lack of training or the disregard for training that this officer and everybody involved exhibited throughout this entire encounter from beginning to end. Yeah, no. And uh, you know, I I would, I, I would find it hard to believe that this is the training that they receive in the Academy. Um, in the Academy, you're, you're told, well, one, if you look at the video, it looks like he comes from the side of the vehicle, not behind. So, you know, we're taught that when you, um, uh, do a traffic stop, you know, you're behind the vehicle, you, you approach obviously with caution. Um, you, when you're speaking to someone, you're speaking not at the threshold of the door, but almost at the threshold of the back door. Mm-hmm. So it, it gives that person uh, 
much more difficulty if he did, does have a weapon to to turn his body, mm -hmm. and, and that's why that's why we do it. And we use our, also our lights mm -hmm. um, to to do some sort of uh, limited vision mm -hmm. uh, to see which way the officers are approaching. Two of the most dangerous things an officer can do, and that that is approach a vehicle or go into a house. And mm -hmm. and I, I just I find it very difficult to believe that this is the Memphis PD training. Um, I think it was uh, negligent on his part. I mean, at the very least for officer safety issues, like you said. Um, mm -hmm. And it, if it was a reckless driver and you need another unit, I just don't see the, the uh, immediate action to go and open someone's door and pull them out of a vehicle. The way the way this occurred, the way well, this officer did. Yeah, uh, neither do I. And we'll take a look here a little bit um, at the second part. So for people who may not have seen the video, um, there's the initial contact. Uh, this uh, uh, primary officer and other officers pull him from the car. He's on the street. Uh, there's uh, uh, mace or pepper spray is uh, utilized several times. Uh, when you have several officers there um, against the driver, and eventually he breaks free and runs. And this takes us to the second second scene here. I'm going to actually, I'll pull the video up here on my phone just to, um, so I know I have the, you know, right timing here. Mm -hmm. But there's a second scene here. It, it looks like there was what we call a bolo, a be on the lookout. Uh, I'm sure that was initiated with this a description of the driver. He ran, he's, he's on foot and it's clear that he was re-encountered by a different officer and or officers uh, where he's detained and eventually handcuffed. And it appears, well, I don't know who they are. I'm going to make an assumption here that, in the scene, eventually two more officers show up. I'm guessing those were the initial officers that made the stop or officer or some officers from that initial scene. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've seen a lot of use of force. I've been involved in a lot of use of force. Um, whether justified or not, I'm talking about in my previous, uh, either as a you know, participant or as a you know viewing public, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. I'm counting right now on, on this video, the one I'm watching at about three minutes into it, about 3.05 or so. I'm counting five officers that have him handcuffed. And I could go in great detail here, but we're, we're looking at fist punches to the face we're looking at him being kicked in the face when he's on the ground. Yes. We are looking <clears throat> at an officer utilizing an ass, a collapsible baton, striking him at least two times. Right. And the idea that this person, that this man is still a threat to the officers or anybody at this point is just fiction. What appears to me is that, like you said, he made it so clear that this is almost certainly not reflective of any training from the Memphis Police Department, no post-training, nothing that, no standardized training would encourage these officers to, to behave like this. These look like a bunch of animals to me. I, I don't know what else to say. They are in a rage. They are without any control and not from the time of the initial traffic stop did I see anything that resembles de-escalation, not in general or not from a particular officer even trying to intervene. No. And, and, you know, just watching this video, uh, two officers are obviously, um, as they say, putting the boots to them, um, and trying to, uh, well, I mean, not just trying to subdue, the um, Tyree, but the, there's a third officer that isn't really involved, walks away, um, and then comes back 
and kicks him twice in the head. I, I don't understand that. I mean, I, it's just, I mean, you continue, now you've got three officers on him, and here comes a fourth officer with a collapsible baton, turns to the side, and now hit is uh, repeatedly hit him one, two, three, four, maybe four times. Uh, he is cuffed at this point. He was cuffed before that. They have him stand up, and here comes two blows to the face, which then puts him down on the ground again. Um, it, it, it just, God, it's just so disturbing to, to, um, uh, to see this, you know, uh, and, and I, I can pretty much guarantee that this is not Memphis PD procedure. Um, and like I said before, unfortunately in, in the business of law enforcement, yes, you have uses of force. And I can say that even good uses of force is, don't look good on right. video and they're, they're not meant to look good. Um, it's a use of force. It's, it's, you know, you have to use force to subdue this, this person. Um, but that being said, there is a limited amount of force that we have to use. And I believe that all law enforcement agencies, um, establish this parameter. And as we said before, yes, we have to use force and for, um, as far as I know, you know, the force that we use has to be reasonable. Right. And it has to be to affect an arrest, overcome resistance, and prevent escape. Mm -hmm. But that said, once that person is cuffed. All bets off. All bets off. Yeah. You know. All, all bets and all hands off. Right. Except for, at, you know. At that point. If it was a fight between you and a suspect, once that person is cuffed, he's either sat up or, or, or stood up and an RA is called for, um, to render aid. And, and the thing is, and we know even with that there, you know, I wouldn't say rare, but there are exceptions. In other words, you can still have someone violent who's handcuffed and, and somewhat dangerous with their feet. There's a, there are restraints designed for that. We've all used them. Either they can still kick you, they can kick out windows of the patrol car, sure. whatever it is. But those are exceptions. And obviously, looking at this, there was um, there was no need for that. On the initial stop, uh, uh, Tyree was saying, "Okay, okay, okay. Hey, what do you want me to do?" Uh, there was there was no resistance from the beginning. Not not one bit that I could see. So. I, um, I'll say this, that, you know, look, this is the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Clearly there was no racial issue here, which Stop. is, is telling we have five black officers. We have a, a black suspect, a black driver. Um, so there's no racial issue here. Here's, here's the issue that these five people, mm -hmm. I hate to even call them officers because this is part of our profession and these these monsters are right now, unfortunately, they're the recent face of law enforcement in the most negative way, the most demeaning way. They do not represent the 98% of officers who do the right thing every single day. But these people became enraged animals. They were angry that the, he was running from them or whatever may have sparked them. They exhibited none of the professionalism that almost every other officer uh, of 800,000 in this country exhibit every single day. But I'll say this that the police chief there, and I didn't see the video until, you know, recently, like everybody else, I saw it right when it came out, but mm -hmm. the weeks leading up to this, and again, every agency has their own procedure. Right. Um, California High Patrol, LAPD, NYPD, you know, whatever it is, have their own procedure as far as discipline, review, internal investigations, dismissal, suspensions. But with this agency, the chief, when she saw this, when she saw the evidence, she fired these individuals as fast as their policies and procedures and laws within uh, Tennessee would allow. And then the DA filed second degree murder charges, charges, sorry, against these individuals. And I'll be honest with you, look at this video. I'm surprised it was second degree. I mean, we, we know the laws. 
you and I do. Um, it, first degree murder obviously has a higher level of intent, you know, specificity. I get that. But my God, if they had filed first degree murder charges, it wouldn't surprise me. But in my opinion, you know, based on what we saw here, the system worked. And as far as the internal review process and as far as the criminal process that the, the system has worked, not to mention the fact, you know, federal charges are coming to, the, to these guys. So yeah. no matter what happens in the state, there's going to be more from the feds. Right. So I'll say that, that we, the system worked. Yeah. You know, um, un- unfortunately we have to um, weed out these officers that abuse their, their power and um, that over uh, use um their powers of, as police officers. Um, you know, we have to understand that people that are in law enforcement, I can tell you that all the people that I know in law enforcement don't want to see this type of uh, enforcement. They don't want to see uh, the bad apples that tarnish the badge, that tarnish the career of um, of these good law enforcement officers. I'm happy in the uh, in the instance that this was captured uh, on tape, that it, it's out there for the public, because there should be transparency. And uh, and you know our cameras, you know every, everyone has body worn cameras now, um, which is a good thing. I always uh, I always thought it was a good thing because you know it, it keeps everyone honest, and you know you can't avoid the video. Right. You know, and um, so in that instance, I'm happy that this this um, video and this uh, I think this camera, this was from an overhead. uh, It was a residence, I believe, um, camera. Uh, And, you know, it it just shows that. I I can understand why people are disturbed. I'm disturbed. Uh, I know you are. Um, But. Like you said, the system works, um, but I have to say that I know that Memphis, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, doesn't matter what law enforcement agency you're from, we don't want this type of behavior. We don't want this type of officer in, on the, in the field. No. It just makes it so much harder for the good officers to do their job. Because unfortunately, you have people out there that look at the uniform and they just connect you with that video, even though you had nothing to do with it. You know, um, even here in Los Angeles, I mean, we had civil unrest. <laughs> Sorry, not civil. Un- we had a riot. Yeah, exactly. You know, politicians <laughs> call it civil unrest. Well, e- even it we're was getting, a riot. Even we're getting brainwashed with this stuff. Yeah, right. yeah. So this riot that occurred to George Floyd didn't even happen in Los Angeles, and yet we were, uh, or the the LAPD and and all local law enforcement in Los Angeles, CHP sheriffs, all had to take the blunt of this this action, um, and so uh, you know I just hope that. People understand that nobody wants these kind of officers on the streets. That being said, don't judge every officer on this instance. Don't judge every officer on what occurred in Memphis or what occurred to George Floyd. Mm-hmm. I said, we just can't do that. We, we, it, it's just unfair to do that. It's unfair. And, and look, this case, it isn't getting more emotional. This, I mean, I, 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 I feel for, this man's family, uh, listening to his mother, you know, being parents, these emotions are, they are powerful. And uh, on the other hand, from a rational point of view, we all have to realize that these things out of the 10 million enforcement contacts, law enforcement officers make every year, this type of use of force is rare, not to mention this type of felonious use of force. So speaking about good officers, which are almost all of them do the right thing, I want to juxtapose this case in Tennessee with some recent stuff and maybe one case specifically here in California with with LAPD. It's got a lot of attention. And again, we've talked about this. We've burned some things up here. 
uh, about another uh, in custody death, considered in custody because uh, even though the uh, the suspect died later on, still considered in custody death based on some parameters. But if you haven't seen the video, this is the one involving uh, Keenan Anderson, uh, Keenan Anderson in in in, um, yeah. in Los Angeles LAPD, and we could talk about this, but. This is a, an instance where you and I, and I think every law enforcement professional, and people who are not even in law enforcement, look at this and say, "My God, these officers exhibited more patience than maybe you know I would at the time, and they did everything." Right. So, right. you, you want to get a little bit of background on that? Well, uh, so the incident with Keenan Anderson, um, this was a traffic collision. I mean, not a big deal. Um, the problem was is that he started walking away or running away from the the scene of the accident. Um, luckily, at that point, um, a motor officer was there, uh, was incredibly, incredibly calm, and telling uh, Mr. Anderson to calm down, calm down, uh, just relax. You could tell that Mr. Anderson was very agitated. Um, he uh, he seemed that he was his heart rate was going at 100 miles a minute, and um, but the officer showed a lot of restraint. Told him just to sit on the uh, on the sidewalk. Um, at that point, I think from there, Mr. Anderson decided to start running. Now the officer, of course, had to do his job. Um, you know, it's just there's such a huge contrast between Memphis and what happened to Mr. Anderson. Mm -hmm. I mean, those officers, I can't tell you how proud I am to see these officers show that kind of restraint and use the policies that are in place for the LAPD. Mm -hmm. You know, they used um, verbalization, which is a form of de-escalation, mm -hmm. trying to get him to calm down. And it just seemed it wouldn't work. It would not work. Uh, unfortunately, then they had to go to a taser, um, which was completely within policy. Um, so, you know, just so we so we understand, so the public understands when we're using um, a taser uh, as a reasonable force option, it's to control a suspect when the suspect presents an immediate threat to the to the safety of officers or others. Mm -hmm. um, when they use that taser, they could not control Mr. Anderson. They, they, they tried. Um, you know, finally, they had to use the taser to effect an arrest, which is part of the use of force policy. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to obviously overcome his resistance and, and um, prevent escape. Well, let me, let me uh, just in interrupt there about the taser, because when you watch that video, <clears throat> and please go look it up, Keenan Anderson, LAPD. You can watch the whole thing. Um, and by the way, it, I said it, it's, 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 it's so refreshing because when you watch this video as opposed to the one out of Tennessee, these, every one of these officers exhibited patience. They exhibited self-control, de-escalation. And even with the taser, when you watch the taser, the officer is screaming, Stop it. Stop resisting or I'm going to use the taser. He gave warnings even before the taser was utilized. And by the way, what we call in this case a, a, a drive stun because there's two different uh, two different modes. You can have the taser in with the, with the prongs or you can actually contact the device directly to the suspect's clothing or skin. And in this case, it was a, a drive stun. And so they're, they're, they are going to every length possible to get this person to comply with the least amount of force possible just showed ultimate uh, professionalism. And by the way, the, and we'll fast forward, we'll come back to a little bit, but the, the, uh, Mr. Anderson actually died, I believe a few hours later, yeah. a few hours later at the hospital. But I want, I just want to chime in there about even the taser. They they showed restraint before they used it, and they could have right away. And not only that, but they they actually warned him that they were going to use the taser, right? Um, which is very important because mm -hmm. um, it says when feasible, you know, you want to warn the person about the taser when feasible. So, yeah, when feasible. Mm -hmm. And um, the officer found it that it was feasible for him to give the warning, um, 
you know, some officers may have said, no, I, I had hands on. I, I couldn't, I couldn't verbalize. I was going to use the, the, the taser, which is perfectly fine. Marcelo, are you telling me, are you actually insinuating or implying that's the right word here that officers have to make split second decisions on the fly for their safety and the safety of those around them? Is that what you're telling me? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, but that, that just goes to the professionalism of these officers that they, that um, they had the opportunity to warn him that they were going to use the taser mm -hmm. yet. He still resisted arrest. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that, that to me is, is, you know, I commend them. I really do. I, I commend these officers for their patience. I commend them for their professionalism. Um, they're adhering to policy and, um, taking uh, Mr. Anderson into custody, um, you know, uh, a simple, and, and this just goes back to the unknown. Unfortunately, we're not in a video game, right? We don't know. We don't have a crystal ball that says that, Oh, this is just a traffic accident. There is nothing that's normal about anything. Nowadays, a mm -hmm. traffic accident turns into a person running, turns into a use of force. You know, you have no idea what is going to uh, expire from, from, uh, from an incident. Mm -hmm. And this is why your training is so important. This is why I'm such against people that say defund the police. Mm -hmm. You cannot defund the police and then ask for more training. Mm -hmm. Officers need, need more training, but let's defund them. Right. How are you possibly going to do that? So, you know, that being said, training has to be consistent. A police department that doesn't give their officers the proper training, it is the responsibility of that department. This is why I am against when I hear LAPD officers say, we shoot once every other month. Mm -hmm. So you're supposed to be efficient mm -hmm. with a weapon that can take someone's life, but yet you shoot once every other month. Mm -hmm. I've seen those, though, that the range, it's five minutes, mm -hmm. it's five minutes and, and it's every other month. So you're telling me that you, that you're sending out police officers who are shooting every other month for no more than maybe five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that is your response to, you have to be efficient with your weapon. Right. Well, but let's go to the other scenario, metropolitan division. I know that those officers shoot every month. They have a whole day of shooting mm -hmm. and they shoot all their weapon systems, all three of their weapon systems, including uh, less lethal. They shoot every single month. In addition to that, they have a tactics day every single month. Mm -hmm. So they're constantly pushing the envelope in training. And we say tactics for, for those people who may not be in law enforcement, we're, we're talking about not only the weapon systems themselves, but, but how to utilize those weapons in real life scenarios. So tech, so building entry, cover concealment, uh, 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 suspect control, negotiation. These are all tactics we're talking about. They train on. Now you make a great point about metropolitan division that I, I know very well and in, in other specialized, uh, tactical units, um, we're talking about a higher level of training than maybe uh, the patrol officer, because that is, you know, for lack of a better phrase, that's their, their reason for existing sure. uh, metropolitan. But <clears throat> you make a good point about is reducing the frequency or level of training ever a good idea? Is it ever a good idea? And I guess one can overtrain, but I'm with you. And I've seen this with other agencies over the last few years where they've actually reduced um, the frequency of just, just range training, just the basic firearms proficiency. They've reduced right. the frequency and, um, good is shooting, you know, 15 times a day over, you know, I mean a, a week or a month, I'm sorry. Is that overkill? Yeah, probably, but it's going to every other month, a good idea. In my opinion, probably not. There's probably a middle ground here. And, um, I, I'm with you about evaluating that and certainly the defund movement. And by the way, we're going to get into that here real quick and, and briefly about um, 
uh, people talking about taking money away from law enforcement, not calling it defunding anymore. But with that said, going back to the training, mm -hmm. whatever level of training these LAPD officers got, damn it, they did a great job with okay. this suspect. And I, I mean, I, again, just like I said, I've never seen anything so bad with the Memphis, Tennessee uh, incident. The the way these LAPD officers handled, handled uh, uh, the Keenan Anderson was exemplary, I, in my opinion. Absolutely. So getting to that, I want to talk about <clears throat> some of these uh, people jumping to conclusions that have no training, have no expertise in law enforcement, yeah. chiming in on social media, chiming in at press conferences, chiming in at city council meetings, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. saying what should have been done, what we need to do next time, that these, where these guys screwed up and they have no idea what they're talking about. Absolutely. So I know LAPD Protective League actually uh, uh, issued a statement on some of this, and if you wanted to just to read some yeah. of that. So this was a great statement by the Los Angeles uh, Police Protective League, and, and they're they're – talking about facts between myth and misunderstanding. And, and I truly believe that the politicians today are just, they lack the understanding of law enforcement. They lack the understanding of, of procedure. And so they just speak off the cuff, if you will, but with lack of knowledge. And, and that's very dangerous in my opinion. So just let me read this um, short statement. Well, it's actually not a short statement, but I'm going to read this, this, this small part of it. It says, there, there's a, there appears to be a lack of understanding of the LAPD's uh, Mental Evaluation Unit, also known as MEU, Mission, Policies, Procedures, and Protocols. In addition, there appears to be a lack of knowledge as to how many MEU smart units, very, very important. Um, I'll continue. Uh, MEU smart units, which consist of one armed police officer and one Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health uh, uh, clinician. clinician, are available. And here's where it's very important. And this is where I say you must understand what we have at the moment. Uh, are available citywide at any one time and how many calls for service the MEU receives in a given year. Outstanding, mm -hmm. because the LAPD, and I'll just throw out a number, 300 calls a day, and you have one mental evaluation mm -hmm. cl uh, clinician available, even if you had a quarter of those to be mental evaluation, that, uh, person will could not get to all those calls mm -hmm. it's impossible of course so again we go back to this uh not knowing this misunderstanding mm -hmm. in order for us to have this you have to hire a lot more a lot more uh amy meu personnel and even then i'll tell you mark even then it's an uphill fight mm -hmm. it's an uphill fight the city is as you know, it's very spread out. Um, you can have, you know, one call for MEU at the San Fernando Valley, and then the next call could be in Harbor. Yeah. What is that? And, and, a, and, what is that? A forty-five? Right. I was gonna say, drive? for those of you listening to Seattle, Washington, or Boston, Massachusetts, yeah, it's 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 across the entire city in rush hour traffic. Forty-five minutes, like by yeah. helicopter. Yeah. Yeah, if you're lucky. <laughs> right. Yeah, if you're lucky. But so, but not only that. Not only that, not only are you talking about just just the the logistics as mm -hmm. far as getting from one scene to another, um, but it's also the purpose of the MEU. Right. In, and I'm going to read a quote here, mm -hmm. and this is under myth and misunderstanding. Quote, I am deeply troubled that mental health experts were not called in, unquote. Quote again, officers failed to request any of the three then available, like you said, three for the entire city of Los Angeles, first of all. Officers failed to request any of the three then available LAPD teams intended to help de-escalate encounters with people experiencing mental health crises. Now, this is in reference to the Keenan Anderson incident out of the traffic accident, who died with cocaine and marijuana in the system later on. And this quote is from now Mayor Karen Bass. 
the purpose of the MEU is not to get there and to assist in getting this person taken into custody. Am I wrong? Their, yeah. their job is, in other words, they're not going to intervene until uniformed or other law enforcement have actually gotten this person into physical custody. And, and, and seriously, I mean, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. No, so the, the purpose of MEU is to respond once the incident or situation is stabilized. Stable, okay. So a, yeah. a man with a, with a knife, you can't say it's stabilized. Correct. So an MEU uh, person is not a police officer, uh, wouldn't know what to do with a man with a knife. Um, and even with Keenan Anderson, it was a traffic collision. Mm -hmm. Why in the world would you Which call... call uh, an MEU person for a traffic collision, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to understand that when officers get there, they have to stabilize the situation to make it safe, to, to, to make sure that, that the incident is safe and then call MEU. Um, but let's go, let's go a little further than that, Mark. Let's say it's an ADW call. And explain what ADW is. To... It's assault with a deadly weapon. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have an ADW call and the person on the other line says, yeah, he's, uh, he's got a knife in his hand, and, he, and he's hearing voices. Okay. What do you want the officer to do? Stay outside of the house until Amy Yu shows up? So let, let's put a scenario together. Let's say he does. Let's say the officer says, okay, I'll request Amy Yu. Now, Amy Yu's coming from... Where? Now they're coming from harbor to mission. Right. Right. So Again, what, another helicopter ride across the city. Right. Let's say with no traffic, 50 minutes mm -hmm. with no traffic. So let's give it 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now an incident occurs inside the house. Who are you going to blame? Right. You know, you're going to blame the MEU officer or are you going to blame the two police officers that stood outside waiting for MEU? Mm -hmm. It's a lose-lose situation. Right. Unfortunately, folks, we do not have a crystal ball. I'm sorry. If we mm -hmm. did, we would have no crime and we'd have no need for police officers. <laughs> but that's not the way things work. An ADW call is an immediate police response. It doesn't matter if he's hearing voices. That's yes, right. you can request MEU, but you have to get in there and stabilize the situation. Right. You have to protect life. That is the core value of the Los, of Los Angeles police, sheriffs, CHP, all over the nation, is to preserve life first. Right. And so it... it, it are you trying to tell me that if the officers wait for MEU and something happens in the house, officer's fault. If the officers don't wait for MEU, go into the house and get into a shooting, officer's fault. It's like, so you're telling me there's no way to win this. 100%. And I'm telling you, Marcelo, you and I are on the same page on this. You laid it out perfectly. From these attractors to law enforcement, and I'm sorry to say it, I don't care if they're elected officials or they're so-called uh, activists, whatever it is. These people are law enforcement detractors. They are not supporters of law enforcement. They can campaign and say whatever they want to, but all I can see or all I uh, evaluate them on are their actions, right. not their words. I'm going to uh, read another one here about, uh, you know, from the Protective League about myths and misunderstandings. Quote, we do not respond. This is from, uh, I think, Council Member uh, Marquise Harris Dawson. LA City Council member, we do not respond to mental health calls with mental health care. We respond with guns and badges and blaring lights and shouting and commands that people may or may not be in a position to adhere to. I got to stop right there. I'm not even done with her quote. So if someone is, we call 5150, if someone has a mental or emotional, or by the way, a substance abuse problem that is limiting their ability mm -hmm. to follow legal ethical moral commands now it's the fault of the officer if this person cannot respond to commands these people are so to me morally corrupt when they say things like this so you have lights and sirens and saying things that people are mean and may not be able to adhere to <clears throat> just this year we have already lost three people i will not be convinced by anybody that any of those people deserve to have their life taken Least of all, Keenan Anderson. Again, Keenan Anderson is the one we're talking about right now. Those officers did everything by the book. I want to read one fact where the protective league responded to that statement from the city council person. Mm -hmm. Fact. 
Not one of those incidents referenced by Council Member Harris Dawson was a quote unquote mental health call for service. It's exactly right. In fact, one incident involved a female victim in possession of a restraining order preventing her male abuser from being near her or her home. Marcella, with that, I'm going to read this quote. You, you gave a, sim a similar scenario about mm -hmm. someone assault with a deadly weapon, ADW, and what's the officer to do? Wait for the male you know, unit or not? Right. The victim reported that the male was, in fact, in her home, would not leave, and that he had access to a large knife. What is the officer to do? So what this council person said is quite frankly, it's pure ignorance or to lie. You pick it. You pick the choice here. But either way, she doesn't even take the time to do enough research to make an intelligent statement, comment, or even give an opinion about these incidents. So I think the protective league has done a great job on, on not only the Keenan Anderson incident, but, but on these uh, similar ones and talking about, uh, um, these units, evaluation units in general. One thing I want to I want to kind of finish up on mm -hmm. in, in general here relates to these conclusions. And by the way, I'll just chime in if there's something else you want to touch on there that I'm missing. No, no, no. <clears throat> I, I I'm just listening to what you're saying, and it and it just goes back to what we're saying. This this not only is it a misunderstanding for some of these politicians, uh, council people. Um, and let, let's face it, there are some council people that just dislike the police and will uh, chime in at any point, even though without the knowledge of police procedures, um, just to basically to say, hey, look at look at me. I'm, 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 I'm going against the Los Angeles Police Department, which is it, it not only ridiculous, it, it's embarrassing um, and it's disturbing, you know, to me to have some politician talk about something. And it's like you said, without doing her research, mm -hmm. without understanding um, police procedures and uh, knowing that officers uh, are there first and foremost to protect life. Mm -hmm. Now, like you said, uh, the three incident, this three incidents, the uh, traffic accident, by the way, was a felony hit and run. Mm -hmm. So that means that the person that uh, uh, Keen Anderson crashed into had injuries. Mm -hmm. So he was actually fleeing from a felony incident. Um, the other one was the ADW, assault with a deadly weapon. Um, and the third one was the restraining order violation. Mm -hmm. All valid police response, not MEU response. Mm -hmm. okay? And even if it is something that MEU should go to, they are not supposed to be the first responders. It, it, they shouldn't be the first right. responders. And this is where I have trouble when... People say, especially politicians that say uh, a mental evaluation unit should be first responders. No, no. <laughs> Do I'm... your research. Understand. Like I said before, we don't have a crystal ball. I wish we did, but we don't. You don't know what in, what's going to uh, what's going to happen in those instant mm -hmm. incidents. We don't have this. It's not a training scenario mm -hmm. where you can say, OK, training's over. Stop. No, it doesn't work that way. It, you know, and I, I just feel like these people are so out of touch of reality that and an ADW can turn into the murder of a police officer just as fast that it could turn into a shooting of that suspect. Correct. Well, the reason I laughed is because, listen, I, I was still around on the job when uh, mental evaluation uh, units – and, and again, they're, you know, different names for different agencies was really uh, being considered and implemented. And by the way, there it's it's not all downside. We're, we're not criticizing the attempt to have those resources when they're practical. But the reason I was giggling about this mm -hmm. is because when I saw these coming in fruition, we, especially in management law enforcement, knew that unfortunately it was going to be very rare where the timing would be right that these units can make a substantial impact on on outcomes and enforcement contacts um and how ridiculous it was that anybody would ever suggest or or is that anyone ever suggest that they should be the first ones on scene 
Right. That is a recipe for disaster. That is a recipe for these people, the mental health care professionals trying to do their job, will become victims before they will become mitigators of a situation. So we knew how unrealistic, I'll use that word, that this whole proposal of having them be the first responders is. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous, um, quite, quite frankly, fantasy. Oops, hey, we had a little uh, uh, camera uh, malfunction there, so we had to reboot. We're good. Marcelo, you said you wanted to kind of edit something I was talking about a minute ago. Yeah, so, you know, just to be fair, um, you know, when we find discrepancies in what we say, you know, I like to correct it right away. Um, one of the things that we said, because we, we did quote um, um, Karen, uh, Mayor Bass, and um, it wasn't f- everything that was in the quote wasn't all her. Yeah, so I see that what, now. What, uh, what Mayor Bass said was, uh, I am deeply troubled that mental health experts were not called in. That was that was her um, comment. Uh, the other comment came from this uh, extremely uh, experienced and uh, a tremendous amount of uh, of experience and an and expert in the LAPD. Apparently, uh, oh, just kidding. It's Kenneth Mejia, the city controller, who knows nothing about law enforcement, mm-hmm. who said the following, uh, and I quote. Officers failed to request any of the three then available LAPD teams and intended to help de-escalate encounters with people experiencing mental health crisis. Uh, ridiculous, first of all. Um, so I just wanted to make that that distinction. Um, obviously, uh, Mr. Mejia is not an expert of the LAPD, no, the, nor does he know policy. Um but apparently he thinks that MEU is there to de-escalate encounters, and they are not. They are there to evaluate, thus the word mental evaluation unit. I know that's hard, but, you know, the answer, uh, the question is in the answer. So anyway, um, I just wanted to clarify that. Well, I appreciate you clarifying that uh, on a serious note, on a more humorous note. Um, we want to make sure we attribute idiotic statements to the right idiots. So um, I'm glad that you actually made that distinction. Um, uh, there are so many floating around. Yeah, it's it's hard to keep track and people chiming in. You know what? Not only do people chime in after the fact with, with dumb and really uninformed statements about law enforcement, but I think maybe even worse is when they chime in before any number of facts are made to the public. And give me an example. You know, we had a a, a horrible, horrible shooting here in Southern California just recently in in Monterey Park, Mm -hmm. California, where this deranged person, um, we still don't know for sure what the facts or the motive was behind this shooting. But so we have these people saying stuff on a local basis about, uh, you know, local uh, political basis here uh, about LAPD and other law enforcement. And then, of course, you have the uh, the federal uh, uh, knuckleheads chiming in. For an example, with this Monterey Park shooting, which turned out to be, <clears throat> which as far as law enforcement professionals is irrelevant to us, we, we don't care. But it turned out to be um, a, a, an Asian on Asian shooting, which, again, it's it's irrelevant. That's to right. me, but it, that's a factual thing. But before the the, the facts came out, we had <clears throat> Chuck Schumer, our wonderful, you know, not our wonderful senator, thank goodness, but a U.S. senator come uh, come out with a statement. This is before there was any press conference. We knew what happened at all. Quote, I, I'm heartbroken by the news of the shooting in Monterey Park amid Lunar New Year celebrations. I'm praying for the victims, their families the first responders, which is wonderful. If you stop there, we can all be on the same page, no matter what your political leanings, things like that. But he continued, we must stand up to bigotry and hate wherever they rear their ugly heads. And we must keep working to stop gun violence. Ah, Well, there it is. There it is. It's the gun violence. It's not the violence committed by an individual. And by the way, I don't see any bigotry here uh, with uh, a perpetrator of a race uh, uh, committing the violence against people of the same race. This is a, an evil uh, criminal who committed this crime. But before the facts come out, Schumer calls this an act of bigotry. 
uh, why I don't know, but it's, it's one more example. And there's more, I won't even get into them because there's so many of these examples where people want to chime in and make these political statements. They don't have any knowledge of the, of the pertinent immediate facts, or they don't have knowledge of law enforcement operations, policies, procedures, or challenges. Um, it gets really, really old, but this is what they're dealing with. And when I said earlier that these people are attracted to law enforcement, they can say whatever they want to, but what I look at are actions. And we're talking about defunding. We're talking about things that are uh, that that label law enforcement racist and systemically racist and things like this. I don't believe that particular individual is living in reality because we know uh, in today's law enforcement, we do not live under those realities. So, um, correct. It um, it's a tough time. But ladies and gentlemen, you have to keep the faith. Each of you, each of us, we have to be our own leaders. We have to keep supporting law enforcement. We have to call out horrible, heinous, evil behavior like we saw in Memphis when we see it. I'm certainly a cheerleader for law enforcement, but I am not a cheerleader for every single officer. I judge people on their individual behavior. And that's what we're doing right now, looking at these animals in, in Memphis who carried out an absolute heinous, quite frankly, in my opinion, murder against this, this, this poor man, um, Mr. Uh, Nichols in, 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 uh, in Tennessee. So keep the faith. I said keep fighting, keep standing up, be outspoken, support law enforcement, be your own first responder, do the right thing, adhere to the law, obey. Uh, abide by orders from law enforcement if you, you know, unfortunately get encountered for, for running a stop sign. Do the right thing. You can always follow a complaint later on. Don't resist. Or call a supervisor to the scene. Absolutely. Quite quite frankly, even a better even better remedy. Sure. Call a supervisor right there. So with that said, Marcelo, I appreciate you so much. Your expertise is greatly appreciated. Your friendship, of course, is even more appreciated. I want to thank my wonderful crew, Vince and Anthony, who are sitting back here right now watching us and fix the problems as they pop up. Do not forget uh, our YouTube channel, Your Leo Nation. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, check out our website, spread the word. We are growing. We're excited about it. We are fighting for law enforcement. We're fighting for the rule of law. Do not forget to click on uh, your Leo project, our nonprofit partner, send a few bucks. We're trying to help as many families of fallen law enforcement uh, officers as we can. We can't do it without your help. And um, we thank you for listening, for watching. God bless you. Stay strong. God bless America. God bless everyone. Thanks.